Hi, I'm Rob Feasy, Neurology Business Manager for Carl Storch UK. Welcome to Bounce 2020. Here behind me you'll see our virtual urology stand. Please follow the link and come inside to take a look at some of our focus product areas. Morning, everybody. We continue in this brave new world of virtual meetings. And after an excellent session yesterday, I welcome you all to this one on neurourology organized by the FNUU section. I'm Rizwan Hamid from London, and it is my pleasure to introduce this session. We have an excellent faculty who will be discussing the management options for the common neurourological conditions we all see in our day to day practice. I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to their views. And like other sessions we'll be asking, we'll be taking questions which we'll try to answer via Zoom chat. The faculty will introduce themselves at the start of their presentations, but I would really like to introduce our international guest and keynote speaker, Professor Jean-Jacques Mandel, who will set the scene of, for our session by discussing the physiology of neurogenic bladder dysfunction. It's a cliche that we normally introduce our guest speakers by stating that he or she does not require an introduction, but I can say with confidence that this is indeed the case with Professor Wendell. John Jack has been the professor of urology and head of department at University of Antwerp for more than two decades. He's recognized as one of the world authorities in neurourology. He has been the president of the ISCOS, which is the International Spinal Cord Organization and has served on the boards of many international organizations. He has more than 450 publications and dozens of book chapters. We're very much looking forward to his excellent lecture. Jean-Jacques, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Jean-Jacques Vindale. I'm a urologist from the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And I was asked for this BAUS meeting to talk about the neurourology, physiology and pathophysiology. I have no conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. This is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. First, I will remind a little bit the normal innervation of the lower urinary tract, which is probably known by most of you well, but I will talk about the normal physiology, the motor function, and perhaps a little less known, the efferent innervation and function. Then we will move to neuropathic bladder dysfunction. I will talk about the different types of neurogenic bladder and their pathophysiology. I will also have two um, specific topics. One is interaction with bowel and how it works in neuropathy, and then how the histology or the pathological findings change. Okay, let's start. The normal neurological function of the lower urinary tract, you see it here on this picture, it is well known. Um, you have the organs, you have the different peripheral nerves, um, which we see and we will come back on them. And then of course the organs where, uh, where we are talking about is the bladder and the urethra with the sphincter. 
the innervation of the lower urinary tract motor function runs through different peripheral nerves, um, both autonomic and somatic, and the autonomic have two different parts, the sympathetic uh, that runs into the spinal cord at a higher level than the parasympathetic, um, and that will count on uh, the results of a neuropathy and the clinical effects of a neuropathy. And then, of course, the uh, somatic, um, which is for pelvic floor and urethral sphincter. It has been a very important um, finding when one has demonstrated where these different nerves actually end in the lower urinary tract which neuroreceptors are located where, and which neurotransmitters can be used to stimulate these neuroreceptors, because there was the key to, uh, 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 there was the key to open the door for good pharmacological treatment. Now, it can see for someone who is not very familiar with the neurogenic bladder, uh, complicated but it's actually easy um, and I think correct mostly if you uh, divide the functional innovation between a sympathetic is for filling, the parasympathetic is for voiding, and the somatic is for the external uh, urethral sphincter and the pelvic floor. Sensory innovation, now you say, okay, you show the same picture and that's actually correct, okay? But you see that the, the point goes up now and every peripheral nerve has uh, pathways to transmit sensory innovation upwards. It comes through two different types of, of fibers, A delta and C fibers, that I'm not going into detail there. But important is to realize that the same peripheral nerves actually take the commands from the brain down and send up information from the lower urinary tract upwards. Let's go now to neuropathy. One can really say that most patients with neurologic disease have a neurogenic bladder. And you see here the percentage of very large literature review on the um, incidence of neurogenic bladder for cerebrovascular accidents, for Parkinson, for multiple sclerosis, for spinal cord injury and for diabetes. And these figures exist also for other of the diseases but it is tremendous, it's very high, and it, it is almost impossible to imagine that a really serious neuropathy can actually not affect the lower urinary tract. You see here also some data on bowel, but we will come back on that later. The um, important thing, first of all, is to find out where the neuropathy is more, mostly localized. Is it in the brain? Is it in the brain stem? Is it uh, in the spinal cord um, above the sacral area, which is so important for the lower urinary tract? Is it actually sacral? Or is it subsacral, like cord equina and peripheral? And we will look into two of these examples. Okay, suprasacral. And you see our same drawing here, but you see like this explosion somewhere in the middle of the spinal cord, which interrupts the pathways running up and the pathways running down. And what we will see is then that you get a very active bladder and a very active sphincter. And this is well demonstrated here. You see, if the bladder fills, there are still uh, potentials running up, but they cannot go higher than where the spinal cord lesion is. And at the one more, and, and at a certain moment, the remaining uh, spinal cord will get full of energy and will send replies back in the form of spinal reflexes, 
and um, that is when when the changes in the function of, uh, 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 are become realistic. Depending on the extent of the lesion, there is a loss of voluntary and supraspinal control, which you can call it. Yes, it is still innervated the lower urinary tract, but it is decentralized. What you will have is an overactive, uninhibited bladder that contracts independently of what you want, an overactive, uninhibited sphincter that does the same thing, and very dangerous, the true the sphincter dyssynergia, which means that the bladder contraction goes at the same time as a sphincter contraction, creating an outflow um, resistance. You see here an example on a urodynamic trace of a 20-year-old man with a T5 lesion, um, American spinal cord injury um, uh, impairment scale A, which is thus following their system, a complete lesion. And then you see that uh, very clearly in the detrusor contraction and in the urethral contraction, you get very high peaks but at the same time, and this results in very, very little outflow. So this is definitely the true sphincter uh, dyssynergia. But it doesn't have to be always so dramatic. Here you see the image in a male 41 years old with an uh, AIS T4A. And there again, you see, yes, there are unstable, little unstable contractions um, in, in the detrusor here, and at the same time, small peaks of the sphincter contraction, but this is also clearly a case of the true sphincter dyssynergia. Now we're talking, uh, we have been talking like if, if uh, a neuropathy almost destroys completely at a certain level the spinal cord, but that's not always the case. The lesion can be in very different spots, like centrally or anterior or posterior or one side. And therefore, the incomplete suprasacral is actually divided in an anterior cord syndrome, for instance, by disruption of the anterior spinal artery, a posterior cord syndrome uh, from tabus dorsalis, for instance, a lateral cord syndrome, as you see in the brown cigar and a central cord syndrome due to a traumatic neck hyperextension. And all these have very specific uh, influences on how the lower urinary tract works. And you see them here, anterior cord syndrome, that's not too difficult to understand that most of them will have uh, the true overactivity and the true sphincter dyssynergia as possible. But bladder sensation and especially bladder feeling sensation will be intact if the dorsal columns are intact. Bronsecar can have a neurogenic detrusor overactivity, but also can have an areflexia. Everything is possible, also detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. And the same goes for central cord syndrome. And the only deficit in posterior cord syndrome is no proprioception might seem complicated, but not if you take uh, a good uh, image of the spinal cord and the different pathways there, and then uh, get pieces out uh, like what happened with the spinal cord uh, deficit. A very important area is the thoracolumbar area of the spinal cord, uh, thoracic 11 to lumbar 2 because this is really the place, uh, then a sort of knot where all this peripheral innervation actually mixes. And you can see here in a study that uh, lesions above uh, number one will definitely have more chance to have a detrusor overactivity dog as spasticity and less flaccid. Um, uh, paralysis. If they are lower than L1, it's just the reverse. The areflexic will be the highest number. 
if there is a lesion directly on thoracal, uh, thoracic 12 and lumbar 1, again, you can have one or the other. So it is in this area of lesions completely unpredictable what a urodynamic situation will be, and it has to be very clearly diagnosed and looked at. Let's move now to another very specific uh, deficit. That's where the corners and the corda equina are lesioned. And you remember the corners is where you have all the sacral uh, for the parasympathetic and for the somatic um, uh, nuclei uh, uh, positioned. If this is destroyed, then of course what will happen is that there is a denervation of your bladder and a denervation of your sphincter. And you can see here, the bladder is filling, but there is no potential send up and the bladder will continue filling and filling until she gets overfilled and stops leaking. In such a case, you can easily talk about denervation. It's not decentralization, but it is denervation. And the detrusor has no reflex anymore. The sphincter is flaccid and the bladder neck is not flaccid. And I hope that you understand why, because this lesion is at the corners, but the hypogastric innervation actually reaches the spinal cord much higher and is responsible for the bladder neck function. So the bladder neck function will still be present. The same goes for pain and slight sensation of bladder filling, which are um, transported by the sympathetic nerves, they still will be present. Let's have a look now to sensory fibers. Sensory fibers, we know from Chet de Groot's work that in normal conditions, it are mainly the A delta fibers that give the input of the innovation and the um, input in the uh, function of the lower urinary tract, but that after a spinal cord lesion, the silent C fibers start to get very active, that they give an, an input, an extra input, and that this can be related to a too active spastic bladder behavior. It is not very often looked at sensation. But look at these figures that, were, that have uh, investigated in quite a high number of a sample uh, that complete lesions above T10, complete lesions above T10, that's still almost 40% at the feeling sensation. And this can only be explained if one accepts that sensory pathways have been saved, even if the um, uh, AIS system says it wasn't. The same with uh, complete lesions below thoracic 10, then you see much more have sensation and this is partly due to the hypogastric and incomplete lesions normally all have this feeling sensation. Important also is that if you repeat your filling tests that the sensations are reproducible. So it is actually strong a um, uh, strong effect uh, and a strong data to say there is much more sensation in a neuropathy than one often thinks. And it's not always the feeling sensation, it's, always, it's also the pain, the sensation of a detrusor or a activity contraction, the sensation of the touch of the perineal area, and electrosensation. And this is so important to be attentive to all these because each of them run in different pathways. And if someone can, uh, can tell you that they feel the neurogenic detrusor overactivity contraction, for example, then you do know that this pathway, which is actually the anterior spinal thalamic tract, must be saved. So you see, it learns a lot about the uh, real extent of the lesion. And then you see electrosensation, 
And electrosensation is an interesting clinical uh, test because it permits you to determine the sensory thresholds with the application of electrical stimulation in different parts of the lower urinary tract. And so separately investigate the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, and the somatic system. And you can use a square wave, which is mostly done or the sinusoidal wave. Uh, but you see, you have an external stimulator. There's a catheter with two electrodes that is positioned against, for instance, bladder wall or can be bladder neck or can be in the urethra. And it is again, very important. This is definitely uh, taken upwards through the um, lateral spinothalamic tract and that this um, electrosensation is often present in neuropathy, even the feeling sensation or perineal sensation of touch is absent. So there's a lot to learn from this um, information. Mahdas Bacher has put all the different patterns of neurogenic detrusus dysfunction together. And you see here the suprasacral spinal, okay, and the sacral, uh, subsacral spinal. Uh, which we have seen, but you see there are other combinations of what the uh, bladder does and what the sphincter do. Let's now look at, uh, the, at, at one very specific topic. Um, if we are focused too much and only on the bladder, we are missing something because there is a connection with the bowel. Bladder and bowel are anatomical neighbors, and the peripheral innervation is the same. The function is partly the same of these nerves. And now we come back to these uh, incident figures, and you see again, they are quite impressive. High, lower than the uh, bladder one, but still very high. And so neuropathic bowel is uh, definitely very prevalent. Where do they work together? Well, Malikina in our studies uh, has well uh, demonstrated that in the pelvic organ cross sensitization, it goes from the, um, sorry, it goes from the door, it goes at the level of the dorsal root ganglia, at the level of the spinal cord at the level of uh, barrington nucleus. And so you see, neurologically, they are influencing and talking to each other all the time. But what happens then after neuropathy? Well, the normal interactions continue in supraspinal lesions in, 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 sup, in sacral or subsacral. They are, of course, completely destroyed. And pathology of one system can therefore influence the other system. And there is more interactions. If you give medications for one system, for instance, to lower the contractility of the bladder, that can affect the, the bowel function with constipation. Other interactions can be seen when you use bowel or intestinal segments for surgery and in electrical stimulation like neuromodulation. Last item is actually, does uh, the tissues of the lower urinary tract change in neuropathy? And you know, uh, we, we are all very familiar with the fact that microstructures and functions are highly uh, interrelated. And there are many important things uh, that change after neuropathy. There is an abnormal cytoplasm in the majority. C fibers become hyperplastic, as we have seen already. There are much more purinergic transmitters and less muscarinic transmitters. So the basic of the function already is changing there. In upper motor neuron lesion, some of these uh, transmitters and uh, markers actually increase. And in the lower motor neuron lesion, they decrease. One giving too much activity, the other giving uh, too little activity. And then we have the very uh, feared um, item of bladder wall fibrosis. Bladder wall fibrosis is something which is feared in neuropathic bladder because it, it disrupts, it interrupts uh, what you can expect of uh, 
your aim of getting a, a low pressure, very big bladder that you can put on intermittent catheterization. And actually bladder wall fibrosis does happen and it has been shown that it is because there is an alteration in the type of connective tissue that mast cells uh, get, get a different influence with collagen synthesis, that there is a significant indication of upper tract deterioration. If you uh, see bladder wall fibrosis in one of the newer data that uh, patients who have been treated by in the Trusa botulinum toxin injections develop significantly less fibrosis. So we come to a conclusion. Neuropathic bladder after spinal cord injury is prevalent. It changes the physiology, it changes the histology, but many of the functions like sensation and interaction with bowel will continue. And this is becoming much more clear and much more um, wider and therefore more attractive if you take uh, if you try to take into account all these actually factual data. Thanks for the attention. Finished. Hello, um, my name is Sheila Reed, and I'm a consultant urological surgeon working in the spinal injuries unit in Sheffield. And my lecture is the neurourology for urology specifically about the spinal cord injured. I want to start my lecture by thanking these two gentlemen. This is Paul Topple and Simon Harrison, and they were responsible for many years for the spinal injury urology course in the UK, and um, they have derived a lot of the slides you're going to see today. So just going to start with a little recap. Um, big thanks to Professor Windell for his excellent lecture um, on um, the neurophysiology. Um, for the patient who's got flaccid paralysis, those are those patients where the conus is destroyed or non-functional. These patients will have an aeroflexic bowel and aeroflexing bladder. For those with spastic paralysis, those with the higher injuries where the distal cord is functioning but the conus is no longer connected to the brain, these patients will have reflex bladder and reflex bowel. So the plan for my talk is to initially talk about bladder management aims. Then I'm going to give you a quick run through the guidelines that are available, talk about bladder management options, and then specific options for the different level of spinal cord injured patients. The aims of this, of the managing bladders in the spinal cord injury, are most importantly bladder safety. Secondly, the prevention of autonomic dysreflexia. Thirdly, the management of continence and symptom control. So bladder safety is very important in spinal cord injured patients. A non-safe bladder is one that puts the kidney at risk of damage. The risk factors are prolonged raised bladder pressure, and the prolonged raised pressure means the kidneys can't drain properly, they develop hydronephrosis, and ultimately they will stop and fail. The two things that cause prolonged raised bladder pressure are prolonged detrusive contraction and poor compliance. This is a typical picture of a spinal cord injured patient with an unsafe bladder. You can see the first three bladder, the dilated ureter going up to the kidney, and the increased pressure has even pushed contrast into the prostate. However, remember, this patient might have normal renal function if his left kidney is functioning normally. Next, we're going to talk about autonomic dysreflexia. Autonomic dysreflexia is part of um, a whole spectrum of autonomic symptoms that the spinal cord injured patients can get. It's caused by overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system below the level of the lesion in response to a noxious stimulus. This gives autonomic symptoms. If you've got a lesion above the level of T6, this causes stimulation of the splanchnic nerves when you get your sympathetic nervous system overstimulation. And it is this that causes the autonomic dysreflexia because of the constriction of the splanchnic bed. Symptomatically, the patient will develop a severe headache severe hypertension, which can be life-threatening, their faces will be flushed, white body, bradycardia. The most common cause of autonomic dysreflexia in this group of patients is bladder distension, and the most common treatment is to empty the bladder. So this is a diagram that, de that demonstrates this. So a lower level injury, you, if you have a full bladder, it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system to give an overstimulation below the level of the injury. 
This causes constriction of the blood vessels and of white legs. You can see there above the level of the injury, um, you get a normal response. So the sympathetic nervous system causes vasodilation, um, and this compensates for what's happening down below. The patient will not get full-blown dysreflexia, but may feel a little bit uncomfortable. However, when you have a higher level injury above the level of T6, when you get a full bladder, you cause um, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, which will include the splanchnic bed, um, you will get severe hypertension, um, you will get flushing above the level of the injury, but that's usually only the face, um, and you will get a vagal response, which will cause bradycardia. Now to talk about some of the guidelines. There are three guidelines I'm mentioning here. From right to left, you've got the NICE guidelines, you've got the European Association of Urology guidelines, and then on the left-hand side, there is the consultation document that came out in 2016. It's a joint document between the SIU and the ICUD. It's an excellent, very comprehensive, although rather long document on the urological management of the spinal cord injured patient. And to very quickly condense some of their recommendations, firstly, there's four validated quality of life measures for urological problems in spinal cord injured patients. The IQOL, the qualifine, the short-form qualifine, and the MBSS. All of the guidelines recommend lifelong upper tract surveillance. That should probably be ultrasounds. They differ slightly in what they recommend between six monthly and two years. Obviously, that depends on the risk that your patient has with regards to bladder safety. All recommend video urodynamics. There should be an initial assessment. There is not really clear guidelines on when that should be, but it should be after spinal shock has worn off and probably within the first year of injury, so probably somewhere between three to 12 months. Also, um, follow-up video urodynamics for those that you feel are high risk, those whose symptoms change, those who get upper tract changes, so specifically if they develop hydronephrosis on their scan or if you're considering surgical intervention. The guidelines also say that you should not perform cystoscopy to screen for bladder cancer in asymptomatic spinally cord injured patients. But remember, they are at higher risk of cancer and you do need to be vigilant. Now to talk about options for bladder management. In the neuropathic patient, there's four options. Voiding with control, contained incontinence, intermittent catheters or indwelling catheters. Voiding with control, the very incomplete spinal cord injury, some actually can void with control. However, most patients who are spinal cord injuries who think they're voiding with control are in fact voiding off a detrusive contraction. And if you have bladder sensation and you know the, the contraction is coming, you can sometimes control it and void appropriately. There are patients who feel they're, void feel they're voiding with control who in fact have areflexic bladder and are emptying by straining because they've got such significant sphincter weakness. Contained incontinence. So in contained incontinence means basically voiding into a sheath or a pad. That's either voiding of a detrusive contraction or passive emptying because you've got severe sphincter weakness. Um, this is a picture of some of the sheaths. You can see on the left-hand side, the kipper bag. This is very ancient, but um, very interesting. And on the right-hand side is the more modern um, silicon-based adhesive sheath. Penile sheath collection has got its problems. Um, sheaths can fall off or blow off. If you've got patients developing very high pressure to trees of contractions, they can sometimes blow the sheaths off. Um, a lot of men, particularly the more overweight men, find that retraction means the sheath falls off. If the sheath is too tight, um, it can develop severe damage. And you can see that in the slide on, in the picture on the right hand side. Remember, a lot of these patients are asensate. And of course, if you're managing your bladder with a penile sheath, you may have an unsafe bladder, so these patients need monitoring. So this is a patient um, who has got detrusive sphincter dyssynergia. Detrusive sphincter dyssynergia occurs in tetra and paraplegic spinal cord injured patients. And it occurs because when the bladder fills, you get a reflex bladder contraction. The reflex bladder contraction um, causes the urine to go into the proximal urethra then the sphincter reflexy contracts on the guarding reflex. So you get this prolonged pressure, and the pressure stops when the um, sphincter gets tarred and allows some urine through. Um, so to manage this, you can either ma manage the reflex bladder contractions or you can do something about the sphincter.
So urethral sphincter obstruction can be managed in three ways, either by doing a transurethral sphincterotomy, using urethral stents, or by using intrasphincteric botulinum toxin. This is a picture of um, a transurethral sphincterotomy. On the left-hand side is pre-sphincterotomy, and right is post-sphincterotomy. You make your incision at 12 o'clock, and you incise from distal to the vero, you incise the sphincter completely, but up until and excluding the bladder neck. Intrasphincteric botulinum toxin has been used. There are some studies which show its efficacy. I haven't personally adopted this yet because um, I feel it's a little bit unsure. Um, you're using this for patients with potentially unsafe bladders and Botox um, it doesn't really have a, a confirmed um, length of action. So I'm never really quite sure how to follow these patients up. But I think it's something we may well be using a lot more in the future. Stents, I spent most of my earlier career taking these out. Um, Intersphincteric sphincts are a great idea, but you can see the problems and um, you get erosion and encrustation. At present, they're not widely used for this indication. So on to catheters. Um, indwelling catheters, there is an excellent lecture about this at one o'clock on Wednesday, so I'm not going to say anything further about it. Intermittent catheterization. Um, if a spinal cord injured patient has got the hand function to do intermittent self-catheterization, they should be encouraged to do it, and you should try and do whatever you can to give them continence. So to give them continence for a reflex bladder, you need to suppress the reflex bladder contractions. And you can do that either with medications. Medications available are anticholinergics um, and mirabegron. You're unlikely to get a completely spinally cord injured patient with a reflex bladder completely dry with these. However, if you've got an incomplete patient or a patient with a suprapubic, they might do very well. They might do well as an adjunct to other treatments. Remember, spinal cord injured patients use oxybutynin, which is an anticholinergic for sweating, so they might be on it anyway. Um, and just be careful of your mirobegron. One of the absolute contraindications to mirobegron is uncontrolled hypertension. Therefore, personally, I avoid mirobegron in patients who are at risk of dysreflexia. Intravisical botulinum toxin is an excellent treatment option for um, to suppress reflex bladder contractions. Remember, it's one of the few treatments that was actually first used in the spinal cord injury population, that very famous Schirsch paper. Cystoplasty, excellent option for this group. Neuromodulation and posterior rhizotomy, I'm not going to speak about any further because there's going to be talk about that later on. Um, cystoplasty, I think everybody watching this lecture knows what it is. So specific to its use in the spinally injured population, um, it works extremely well in this population. However, it is a major surgical procedure. The patient needs to be able to do intermittent catheterization, and we, we do not offer cystoplasties to those patients who do not have the function to do that. Um, however, the caveat to that is, if you have a patient that cannot access their urethra but has the hand function to do catheterization, you might want to offer them a mitrofenoff. Um, and I think particularly the female patients, um, they may have the hand function to do the catheterization, but they may not have the physical ability to pull their trousers down and get on the toilet to do it. Um, and if that is what's stopping them, then I think mitrofenoff is an excellent option. Um, just also be wary of the bowel effects. Um, spinal cord injured patients have lots of bowel issues. Um, you do not want to turn somebody and um, give them, make them dry from a urinary point of view, but give them fecal incontinence. But on the plus side, if you've got somebody doing really well with botulinum toxin, um, they're going to have to have it regularly for the rest of their life. So you should consider a cystoplasty. Um, lastly, I want to talk about this paper. This is a lovely paper. Um, it was published in Your Urology Eurodynamics in 2019, and it looked at more than 800 spinally cord injured patients performing intermittent catheters. There was three groups, those with no treatment, those with botulinum toxin, and those who'd had cystoplasties. Um, from the point of view of urinary function and satisfaction with their urinary symptom, those who'd had cystoplasties did much better than the other groups. So lastly, I want to talk about the different levels of spinally cord injured. This poor young man um, jumped into a swimming pool and he developed a C5 tetraplegia. As a C5 tetraplegia, he's got no movement or sensation below his upper chest. He's got minimal hand function and he will never be able to do intermittent catheters. He's at risk of autonomic dysreflexia, and he's got reflex bladders, reflex bowel, and reflex erections. Because he can't do intermittent catheters, his bladder management options are limited. He can have an indwelling catheter, and we would recommend a suprapubic in this situation. 
he could manage with Pinot sheath collection, but remember um, that maybe on the safe he does need monitoring, he may need something don't doing to his sphincter. Sacral anterior root stimulation is not widely available, and a urostomy is an option for him, but it's a very major option and not one you would go through into at first line. So when we get down to the paraplegic, paraplegic patient has got the same function in his bladder, bowel, and erection, so that's reflex as the tetraplegic. However, what the paraplegic has is the ability to do intermittent catheters and to do transfers. Therefore, that opens up his options. He could have botulinum toxin and do intermittent catheters. He could have a cystoplasty. Um, very good options for this group. This group, the flaccid and low spinal injuries, these patients um, where the conus in dam has damaged, they have areflexic bladder, areflexic bowels. They will have absence of detrusive function, likely poor emptying, may have poor compliance, and will have stress incontinence. This includes any injury that knocks out the conus completely. It, it com includes a complete corda equina. When I talk about complete, I mean it is a complete injury across all of the corda equina nerves. As in the picture on the right-hand side, this lady had a severe sacral fracture which knocked out all her corda nerves. Um, and it also includes the transverse myelitis and ischemic injuries. They may be much higher levels of injuries that you would be expect, but these patients will be flaccid um, um, injuries. This urodynamic study shows poor compliance. So this is a patient with an areflexic bladder, which was when it was filled to 300 mils, had a PDET of 80 centimeters of water. This is an unsafe bladder at that volume. So be careful of that. And the rule of managing neuropathic stress incontinence is to ensure the bladder is safe before treating. Do not turn a safe wet, wet bladder into an unsafe dry one. The surgical options for neuropathic stress incontinence in men are an artificial sphincter and urethral closure. In women, autologous slings, artificial sl sphincters are probably most used. You can use bladder neck injections, corpus suspensions, urethral closures. Please note that MESH, although it's on a general suspension in the country at the moment, was never recommended for neuropathic stress incontinence by NICE. Lastly, to talk about cordas. Um, be, be careful when I talk about complete and incomplete. I'm talking about the degree of injury. That's different to what spinal surgeons talk about. They talk about complete and incomplete in the development of the injury at the time. So we've talked about complete. The incomplete cordas are the ones that you by far see the most often. These are the ones with the disc injuries where different nerves have been knocked out. These can cause anything. Reflex bladder, areflexic bladder, normal compliance, abnormal compliance, stress incontinence, urethral relaxation incontinence, but typically poor bladder emptying and stress incontinence. And in this group, you can see urethral relaxation incontinence. <clears throat> urethral relaxation incontinence is leakage due to urethral relaxation in the absence of raised abdominal pressure or detrusor overactivity. And these patients typically give a diagnosis of flooding incontinence the urodynamics is almost impossible to diagnose, which is usually normal, and typically it occurs in these incomplete corda patients, patients with suprapontine injuries. Um, it may be the reason, if you've done a cystoplasty, that it hasn't worked, because they may have had to treat their overactivity, which you've treated with your cystoplasty, but you've missed the urethral relaxation incontinence, and the treatment is a sphincter. And because this is likely to be something that's happening up at brain level, I've wondered, is there a royal for, role for neuromodulation? I'm not aware of any evidence of that so far, but watch this space. I'd like to finish my talk with this excellent mantra. Um, if you remember this for managing your neuropathic bladders, there is no such thing as a safe or unsafe bladder, only safe or unsafe management. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Altaf Mangera, and uh, today I, I will be speaking to you about the suprapontine lesions uh, for neurourology of the urologist. So when you look at the NICE guidelines, which were published in August 2012, uh, the part that we're concentrating on are the brain conditions. However, MS and Parkinson's disease is covered elsewhere, so we're left with the following uh, highlighted conditions. Now, generally speaking, with suprapontine lesions, you get loss of uh, tonic inhibition of the pontine matrician center. That's because the lesion is above the uh, pontine matrician center, 
and uh, patients tend to get a spontaneous involuntary detrusor overactivity, but that's quite different to the detrusor overactivity that occurs after a suprasacral uh, spinal cord injury. Now, um, when we look at uh, studies, generally speaking, for patients with suprapontine lesions, they tend to have a normal flow and the postvoid residual is expected to be normal as well. We must also remember that there can be concomitant uh, pathology. A pseudo dyssynergia is described uh, in the literature. This is when somebody uh, voluntarily withholds their uh, sphincter and stops it from uh, em stops their bladder from emptying, which is different to the detrusor sphincter dyssynergia we see uh, with a uh, suprasacral um, injury. Uh, occasionally, patients can have a detrusor overactivity and an impaired uh, contractility uh, as well. Now, uh, with suprapontine lesions, you'd expect the sensation to be uh, quite variable, and it's all about perception of the um, sensation. Uh, they will or possibly can lose their voluntary initiation, though, because the cortex can be involved in, in the uh, pathology. Now, when this happens, the effect is loss of uh, a coordinated, uh, uh, sorry, the effect is uh, re remaining of the coordinated reflex voiding, but they tend to end up with a more functional stroke, uh, social incontinence. However, the kidneys are likely to be uh, safe. And th that means that the upper tracts will be safe, but because it's a functional or a social type of incontinence, um, it, it can be quite difficult to uh, manage. Now, um, when we look at cerebral palsy, um, we're urologists, so I'll go into a little bit about cerebral palsy. Um, that's a developmental damage that occurs to parts of the brain, and it can be separated into that which is spastic, uh, which affects the motor cortex, ataxic, which is more cerebellar, dyskinetic affecting the basal ganglia, and it can also be uh, mixed uh, as well. Now, it can be further divided into patients that are unilateral, so one whole side of the body or half just the lower limb, and that would be the hemiplegia patients. And then it can be bilateral where it's affecting uh, both legs. Um, but if it's affecting all four limbs, then that would be uh, quadriplegia. So uh, bi bilateral cerebral palsy can be biplegia or quadriplegia. Now, when I looked at the systematic review, they explained that patients with cerebral palsy, three quarters of them, of them will have some form of pain somewhere in their uh, body. A third of them will suffer from an intellectual disability. One third of them are unable to walk. Uh, one quarter of them are not able to talk and a quarter of them will have uh, bladder problems. So it's quite a high proportion of patients with uh, a multiple uh, level of uh, problems. Uh, also, when we look at uh, young children, they do um, attain their um, achievement of their uh, continence later than uh, children who do not have cerebral palsy. And uh, storage symptoms tend to be more common in those with more severe cerebral pal palsy, i.e. those with spastic quadriplegia, um, have more symptoms. Now, um, this is an interesting study where they took 214 patients with uh, cerebral palsy and uh, those that had symptoms, they did uh, urodynamic assessment on them and 16.4% had a neurogenic uh, bladder. The definition for neurogenic bladder was quite loose, so it was quite inclusive, but 16% uh, of them did uh, were described as having a, neuroplegic, a neurogenic bladder. Uh, however, the hemiplegics did not have a neurogenic bladder, so that points towards um, cerebral um, maintenance occurring on the other side for um, uh, bladder function. Now, 80% um, of those that did have a video urodynamic study did show uh, detrusor overactivity. Uh, and the majority of these patients, conservative measures, for instance, time voiding, reminding um, patients that they need to go and void before they're incontinent was uh, found to be beneficial. So that'd be a good point to take away that um, conservative measures uh, do um, improve the quality of life in uh, the majority of patients with uh, bladder symptoms who have cerebral palsy. Uh, in young children, so a, a selective dorsal rhizotomy can also improve uh, function. The dorsal rhizotomy is mainly done to try and reduce their spasticity, um, but when they looked back, they did find that it did improve their um, bladder function in parameters such as 
uh, bladder capacity or functional uh, uh, bladder capacity and uh, time to uh, incontinence. Uh, but there, there are really small case series with no uh, real long-term follow-up. Moving on to uh, stroke, now um, quite a busy slide I'm afraid, but 50% um, of patients who have had a stroke in the acute phase will report um, some form of uh, incontinence. When we go on to the more chronic phase, once they've uh, been rehabilitated, 28% um, have ongoing overactive bladder type symptoms, frequency, urgency, uh, and incontinence and nocturia as well. Um, and then advanced age and male gender were uh, risk factors. Uh, another study uh, looked at 60 patients and where the lesion was and what uh, blood abnormality. So if it was a cortical or an internal capsule lesion, then uh, detrusor overactivity was more common. Uh, the areflexic detrusor uh, was more common in those with a cerebellar lesion. And uh, those that had a hemorrhagic stroke also had a high risk of uh, uh, an areflexic detrusor. When uh, urodynamics have been undertaken in large uh, numbers of stroke patients, we found uh, detrusor overactivity is the most common uh, finding. Uh, however, 15% uh, do have a detrusor underactivity and 15% have a detrusor overactivity with impaired uh, contractility. Now, um, how do we manage such patients? So um, when I looked at the literature, there was a very good Cochrane uh, systematic uh, review that was only published last year. Now, behavioral training is recommended, um, but the evidence for it in the literature is quite poor, um, but because it's a, a low level sort of non-invasive um, intervention, it, it is recommended. Uh, looking at pharmacological agents, um, there's no real good evidence according to this Cochrane systematic review. There's a number of small studies but the majority of patients in these studies are combined uh, pathologies. And uh, when you drill down to the actual number of patients with uh, stroke, it does get uh, quite small. Um, there is uh, some evidence for transcutaneous or tibial nerve uh, stimulation in the literature. The other kind of findings uh, in patients with stroke, uh, nocturnal polyuria is uh, very common, uh, possibly related to obstructive sleep apnea, other comorbidities that a lot of these patients will have diabetes. And so that's just something in the back of your mind that you'd want to also uh, consider. When you look at real life outcomes in patients that have had stroke, um, this is quite a good uh, study. It's quite old, but um, it kind of probably points to what, what happens in real life. 143 patients uh, end up with a pad or a convene, some sort of collection device. 64 patients ended up with indwelling catheters. Uh, only one out of uh, 332 patients could or needed to ISC. Uh, 39 were having IC or IC done by a, a third party, and some patients did undergo a, a TURP, but they did not report exactly how many. Moving on to uh, dementia, so th these are the possible kind of uh, etiologies uh, for dementia. And... Um, Head injury, um, 280 patients after uh, an acquired uh, brain injury, 50% had uh, uh, bladder problems before discharge. And then uh, a lot of these patients were in a rehabilitation center, 36% of them had ongoing problems at discharge, but only 3.5% uh, were set bladder goals. So it's something that the um, discharge centers or the rehabilitation centers don't really um, look into very much or have uh, solutions uh, for. And then uh, patients that have had head injuries and had uh, urodynamics, quite low numbers that I could find in the literature. Some patients have had detrusor overactivity, uh, low number of uh, patients get uh, detrusor underactivity. If they've had a left hemispheric injury, they're less likely to have uh, detrusor underactivity compared to someone with a right uh, hemispheric injury. Uh, going back to dementias, now um, urinary incontinence uh, in patients with dementias, depending on their definition and uh, the study that you uh, read, 11 to even up to 90% can have uh, urinary incontinence. Um, it's higher in uh, patients with uh, white matter, stroke Lewy body dementia, it's 90% compared to those with uh, Alzheimer's where it is uh, uh, only 40%. Uh, half of uh, the patients uh, that underwent neurodynamics uh, were shown to have uh, detrusor overactivity. 
Uh, other patients uh, can have impaired uh, detrusive contractility, which is less common in, in the literature or in studies where um, patients have had urodynamics and uh, urethral relaxation incontinence. Uh, again, it's uh, quite infrequent in these patients. It's quite a difficult thing to uh, diagnose as well. Um, managing patients with dementia, um, behavioral therapy, um, again, quite poor evidence, um, but it may be effective for uh, some patients if there is uh, compliance. Uh, Antimuscarinics, we have to be cautious as it can uh, worsen uh, cognition. And Myra Begron, again, uh, the evidence is uh, quite poor um, uh, for it in this select group of patients. Um, one other thing, uh, idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, which can be uh, put into the superpontine group. It peaks in the sixth or seventh decade of life. Men and women are equally affected. The classical triad is uh, gait disturbance, dementia, and uh, urinary incontinence. The urinary incontinence tends to be more of an urgency type with uh, detrusive overactivity seen in 95% of patients. The primary treatment would be to insert a uh, BP shunt. However, if they persist, then uh, antimuscarinic agents uh, may be useful. So to summarize, um, we've gone through the different um, uh, superpontine lesions that uh, we commonly uh, come across. Uh, these patients can be trying. Um, it, it is quite difficult to treat the underlying pathology and to treat the brain itself, um, but they are generally uh, safe. Uh, the different uh, options available uh, would be to give them uh, an explanation of, of the problem if uh, they've got the cognition to uh, understand that, and sometimes that's all that's required. You can try and contain the incontinence, so use um, sheath in uh, men or uh, pads uh, in men or, or women. Um, we can try and control the incontinence, so use anticholinergics, myrobegron. They have to be with caution. Uh, similarly, Botox can be used. Uh, in these patients, but there needs to be a method of bladder emptying if we uh, do go down this route. Uh, we can divert with uh, catheters, uh, a conduit. Uh, cystoplasty is rarely required in this uh, cohort of patients, possibly in the cerebral palsy uh, population if there's uh, poor compliance, if they've got a um, neurogenic bladder that has led to poor compliance, uh, it may be useful. And I think one thing that's not really uh, been investigated very well and probably requires more research is uh, sacral neuromodulation, because we do know that sacral neuromodulation works uh, on the uh, afferents uh, going up to the brain, and this is a superpontine problem. So it may be something that can work quite well in uh, this cohort of uh, patients. To finish with some uh, practical uh, tips, I think it's very important to uh, set uh, realistic expectations, um, have a holistic approach. You know, uh, patients will have a lot of different things that are affected by their superpontine lesions, and all these need to be taken uh, on, on board. Remember all the comorbidities that they can have. Uh, a lot of uh, elderly patients who've had a stroke will have uh, BPE, they might have poor pelvic uh, tone. They may suffer from polyuria, nocturnal polyuria. The diabetes could cause autonomic neuropathy. They may have vasculopathy as uh, well. And so all these things need to be um, taken into account. Lifestyle changes, because it is a superpontine uh, problem, can be uh, effective uh, in uh, helping these patients. As a urologist, you, you'd want to try and check bladder emptying. Uh, the bladder is emptying adequately. Uh, you may need a video urodynamic study to assess this. Um, it can be quite difficult to uh, assess post void residual in someone who won't void on uh, commands. So you may need to do serial recordings or keep them in for half a day and check that they are emptying the bladder. The other adage that you know all, all, all urologists are aware of, a happy bladder is an empty bladder, but a happier bladder is an empty uh, rectum. So uh, a lot of these patients will have uh, problems emptying their bowels as well, which may need addressing uh, concomitantly. And then uh, finally, the use of uh, antimuscarinic uh, agents, uh, use them with uh, caution. Um, we know the side effects of uh, impaired uh, cognition. Um, and then uh, pads may be... Uh, appropriate in a lot of these patients. And sometimes we just need to take back a uh, step back and resist the need to uh, do something. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name's Ian Beckley. I'm one of the neuro URG consultants from Pinderfields Hospital in Wakefield. And I'm going to cover what a urologist needs to know about Parkinson's disease. 
I'm going to start with a brief overview of Parkinsonism. I'm then going to describe the neurological features of Parkinson's disease. And finally, I'm going to discuss the investigations and treatment of these conditions. Parkinsonism refers to a symptom complex comprising motor and non-motor symptoms. The classic motor symptoms are reduced movement or akinesia, rigidity, which may be cogwheel or lead pipe, and arresting tremor. The non-motor symptoms include cognitive changes, mood disorders such as anxiety and depression, sleep disorders, and low any tract symptoms. It's most commonly due to Parkinson's disease, but no talk on this subject would be complete without also discussing multi-system atrophy. Histopathologically, Parkinson's is described as, sorry, characterized by loss of dopamine-containing neurons from the basal ganglia. And this leads to impaired regulation of motor cortex activities. Idiopathic Parkinson's is the most common form, but it's also caused by vascular incidents and drugs such as antipsychotics and antiemetics. There are other rarer causes, the most important of which from a neurological point of view is multisystem atrophy. MSA is a disorder of unknown etiology affecting the extrapyramidal, cerebellar and autonomic pathways. Histopathologically, we see features which are not associated with Parkinson's, such as selective atrophy of anterior horn cells, including those of onus nucleus. Previous classifications have included a number of other conditions, such as Chardrega syndrome, but more recent classifications have uh, classified MSA as MSAC, which is cerebellar dominant, and MSAP, which is Parkinsonian dominant. And it's thought that up to 50% of patients with MSA were initially misdiagnosed as having Parkinson's disease. MSA has a much worse outcome in terms of survival from the onset of symptoms to death, which is less than 10 years. The importance of differentiating between these two conditions was highlighted in a landmark study by Chandramani and Fowler in 1997. They performed a retrospective review of 93 patients with MSA or Parkinson's who presented to their clinic with Boris Muni symptoms and it demonstrated that the patients with MSA had significantly worse outcomes from bladder outflow or stress incontinence surgery compared to those with Parkinson's. They then established urogenital criteria to help differentiate between the two conditions. These included the fact that patients with MSA tended to present with erectile dysfunction or LUTs prior to their neurological symptoms. They're more likely to have troublesome urine incontinence and a raised residual of over 100 mils. And as previously noted, they tended to have worse bladder function after surgery. In terms of the symptoms associated with Parkinson's, Storage LUTs are extremely common. They tend to be occurring usually a few years after diagnosis and nocturia is the most common symptom. They tend to get worse as the disease progresses and the etiology is unclear, but we do know that the mitrician reflex is under the influence of dopamine. It acts centrally on D1 and D2 receptors, which are inhibitory and stimulatory to the bladder respectively. Dopamine binds to these receptors with different affinities in different locations under different conditions, but the overall net effect of the basal ganglia on the mitrician reflex is inhibitory, and this explains why there's a preponderance towards storage symptoms. In terms of investigation, simple urophlometry can be used to identify those with a raised residual, but the mainstay of investigations, as with most neopaths, is video urodynamic studies. In the filling phase, sensation is preserved. The choose overactivity is common and tends to occur early. In the voiding phase, we may see voiding dysfunction secondary to an underactive or acontractile detrusor. There may also be a degree of urethral obstruction secondary to what's known as sphincter bradykinesia, which is delayed relaxation of the striated urethral sphincter. DSD, the detrusor sphincter dysenergia, is rare in Parkinson's patients only affecting about 4% of patients, but it's much more common in MSA where it can affect about 50% of patients. Patients with MSA also typically have an open bladder neck at rest or at the start of the filling phase, and this is thought to be due to atrophy of the anterior horn cells of onus nucleus. There's the lack of double-blind controlled studies investigating the management of storage symptoms, 
in Parkinson's patients, but anticholinergic agents such as oxybutynin have been used widely. Increasingly, though, we're concerned about the risk of the anticholinergic burden, and Parkinson's patients receive cholinesterases to uh, reduce their risk of symptoms such as um, memory impairment. They also have anticholinergic agents for symptoms such as excess saliva production. We know that Parkinson's patients tolerate anticholinergics poorly and can suffer with hallucinations as well as things like cognitive decline. And therefore, attention has turned towards using Mirbegron as an alternative. It's less widely studied, although I did identify one small study involving 50 patients who were refractory to uh, anticholinergic agents. They received Mirbegron and noted a cure improvement of their LUTs at six weeks. And there's also preservation of treatment in 50% of these patients at one year. For patients where medication is not effective, Botox can be used safely and is going to be effective even at the reduced 100 unit dose. There's obviously a risk of um, patients not being able to perform IC if they have poor hand function secondary to their tremor, but fortunately there's not been a significant problem in Parkinson's patients receiving Botox, although the caveat to that is that most of the studies looking at this involved women. In terms of neuromodulation, deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus is indicated for patients with severe motor symptoms. And some studies have shown an improvement in LUTs and videodynamic storage symptoms, such as uh, decreased bladder capacity and uh, decreased residual. So increased bladder capacity and a decreased residual. Sacral neuromodulation has been studied far less extensively. I found one small study involving 13 patients who had implants for refractory overactive bladder. Seven of these patients still had a working implant at two years. And four of the patients had, had them removed for loss of efficacy or for discomfort. For treating voiding symptoms, tamgelosin is effective, but obviously there's a risk of postural hypertension, which can be an autonomic or non-motor feature of Parkinson's. For patients who don't respond to medication, TRP can be used and is not contraindicated if Parkinson's is confirmed and MSA is excluded. It's important to perform a thorough clinical assessment of these patients. We know that those who cannot perform a voluntary contraction of the sphincter A&I are at risk of worse outcomes in terms of urine incontinence following surgery. In equivocal cases or where the diagnosis is unclear, sphincter AMG, where it's available, can be used to help differentiate between Parkinson's and MSA. So in conclusion, LUTs are very common in Parkinson's disease. They tend to be storage predominant and respond well to conservative measures. For those patients who don't respond to medication and have bothersome storage symptoms, Botox can be used and there may be an increase in role for new modulation, but obviously that requires further study. Voiding symptoms can also be managed medically, and if TRP is required, MSA does need to be excluded. Thank you. These are my references, and I'm happy to take any questions. Good morning. I'd like to say thank you to Sheila and the committee for inviting me to speak uh, today, uh, and I'm delighted to spend the next 15 minutes talking about uh, multiple sclerosis. I have nothing to declare. So as we know, uh, multiple sclerosis is a primary progressive neurological condition uh, that causes demyelination of the um, nervous system. It predominantly affects young patients and is the commonest neurological condition in patients less than 30 years of age. There is a male to female preponderance of one to three, and this sex dysmorphism uh, may be explained by um, sex chromosomes, sex steroid hormones uh, on the immune system, the blood brain barrier, and on the parenchymal central nervous system. It has a reported prevalence within Europe of 83 per 100,000, although it is higher in the UK, and we will come on to look at that in a minute. The vast majority of patients will have lesions in the periventricular white matter. Uh, spinal lesions uh, or lesions within the spinal cord are known to occur uh, and they tend to be cervical, but they're almost always associated uh, with central lesions as well. So when we look at the UK prevalence, you can see that in God's chosen uh, country, uh, Wales, just 179 per 100,000 people uh, have uh, multiple sclerosis. As we move further north up the country, we can see that the rates increase uh, with the highest rates being reported in Scotland. 
slightly off the map to the right hand side, uh, the Orkney Islands have the highest reported UK prevalence rates of 400 per 100,000. Race um, blood does play a part in the effect of MS uh, on the population. We know that there are high rates in Canada, um, but not amongst the native Inuit people. The same is seen in Scandinavian countries with high rates uh, in, the, in the population, but much lower rates uh, in the Lap and the Samai people when compared to the rest of the population. The etiology of uh, multiple sclerosis is complicated and not fully understood. Uh, we know that there's some abnormal immune reaction to the myelin antigens in susceptible individuals, uh, but what triggers this abnormal immune response is not known. For many years, the Viking gene was touted as uh, one of the uh, factors, um, but we know now that the genetic factors are more complex than a single gene loci. From twin studies, we know that affected dizygotic twins are much more likely to have MS in the um, non-affected twin uh, when compared to monozygotic twins. Um, reduced sunlight has long been touted uh, as, uh, as an issue, and it is likely that this is as a res response to low vitamin D levels. Uh, viral infection has also been known uh, uh, to cause or to trigger MS. Uh, there's a lot of work on Epstein-Barr virus uh, and its effect on MS, but more recently after the SARS outbreak, coronavirus has also been detected uh, in brain tissue of affected uh, MS patients. And it will be interesting to see if the novel COVID-19 coronavirus uh, causes uh, and triggers MS. The presenting symptoms of MS are variable, but the classics include visual disturbance as a result of optic neuritis, fatigue, uh, spasms, um, depression, uh, which is often overlooked, but can be up to 70%, and rarely low urinary tract symptoms, so accounting for just 10% of those patients uh, as a presenting complaint. MS is classified into four groups, and you can see that I've not included uh, all four on this slide, uh, and that's because clinically isolated syndrome uh, is the first type of MS and is often the initial presentation. Uh, patients who have a diagnosis of uh, CIS, clinically isolated syndrome, should have had their symptoms for more than 24 hours. Interestingly, uh, if these patients do undergo MRI scan, uh, there can be characteristic uh, lesions noted. And if they are, there is some research now to suggest that starting treatment uh, with immune modulators earlier rather than later uh, can have a beneficial effect on their disease course. Um, what we are aware is that these patients have a high um, percentage that go on to develop full-blown MS. So the first uh, diagram demonstrates relapsing, remitting MS, and this is the most common type. It affects 85% of those with a diagnosis of MS, and is characterized by periods of disease uh, relapse uh, and remission. Uh, there's generally speaking either a full recovery or a partial recovery, and, and often uh, patients uh, can deteriorate uh, slowly over time. The second form of, uh, or the third form of MS, I should say, is the secondary progressive MS. Um, this starts normally with an initial relapsing and remitting uh, type picture, uh, but then goes on uh, to uh, have a generalized deterioration uh, in the patient's uh, neurological function. Uh, and finally, we have uh, primary progressive MS. Um, this demonstrates a gradual worsening of the MS symptoms uh, from initial diagnosis. And this only affects 15% uh, of patients with uh, an MS diagnosis. The urinary symptoms uh, that we may see as urologists uh, include neurogenic detrusor overactivity um, with urgency, frequency, and urge incontinence. Often they have recurrent uni tract infections, which is likely as a result of incomplete emptying as they have uh, insufficient or inefficient um, bladder emptying, which may be as a result of detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Uh, often the female patients will also complain of stress urinary incontinence. Uh, this paper nicely summarizes the uh, percentage of patients uh, which have um, the range of urinary symptoms. And we can see that urinary frequency, urgency, and urinary incontinence are by far the commonest um, symptoms that the patients will complain of. Now, there are no specific um, ICI or EAU guidance on the management of MS. Um, there is uh, general advice on neurogenic bladder 
Um, but when we are looking at uh, the management of MS, there are some um, consensus uh, reports um, and which can help us uh, in the management. Um, the first was drafted by Fowler in 2008 um, and really was a comprehensive, useful guide uh, for uh, clinicians uh, in how to manage uh, neurogenic bladder. Uh, subsequently, we had the Turkish group reported in 2013. And more recently, we have Jalesh Panika uh, working with the French uh, team uh, to produce uh, an up-to-date um, recommendations. And if we look at some of the recommendations that they have, uh, they often uh, focus on the investigations and the vast majority of patients with MS um, do not need um, to have uh, a deal of investigations. We would normally recommend uh, history, examination, urine dipstick looking specifically for infection, uh, a bladder diary, uh, an ultrasound scan, which would include a post void residual and an upper tract scan uh, and a blood test looking at kidney function. For the vast majority of patients, if they have residual uh, urine of more than 100 mils, we would normally recommend uh, initiating uh, clean intermittent self-catheterization. I think the only thing that's changed in the 20, 2008 and the 2016 guidance uh, is the inclusion of urodynamics uh, as part of the assessment. Uh, in the UK, it is not routinely recommended that urodynamics is undertaken as part of the initial assessment, but rather is reserved to patients who have um, or who are at risk of having upper tract uh, problems or who are being considered for surgery. Um, in the vast majority of individuals, um, it's, it's not indicated. However, we do know that uh, the French guidance um, does include urodynamics both at the initial assessment and also at three yearly intervals uh, throughout the disease. So this um, rather lovely um, cartoon has been shown uh, over the years from the 2008 paper by um, Professor Fowler and I think it really does sum up the, the management. So in the first group of patients who are walking unaided, uh, the vast majority would be managed with uh, anti-muscarinics uh, with or without um, Desmopressin. We know that um, there's no good evidence for the use of antimuscarinics in the MS population. However, the vast majority of patients do benefit. Um, as they are younger patients, whilst we are concerned about hyponatremia, it's not the same as uh, older patients, um, but I would always recommend uh, checking sodium at the outset of treatment and at fairly regular intervals. intervals. As the patients become more disabled and their symptoms uh, potentially deteriorate, um, this is normally when we would add in some form of intermittent self-catheterization. Um, this patient group also would uh, often benefit from botulinum toxin injections into the bladder. Um, there is data to suggest that there's no benefit in um, giving 200 or 300 units, um, but I can say from my own personal practice that um, there are some severely affected MS patients who do benefit from that higher dose. Uh, once the patient becomes wheelchair bound, particularly female patients, they are likely going to need to consider suprapubic catheterization as a long term bladder management. Uh, and finally, um, indwelling catheter for those that are bed bound is always recommended. Now, there are some data regarding the use of neuromodulation in the management of uh, neurogenic bladder. Uh, specifically related to MS, the data is limited. There are benefits, obviously there's no anticholinergic burden and in patients in whom this is an issue, uh, then it certainly should be considered. It's good in the management of mild or moderate uh, neurogenic to choose overactivity. And I have to say from my personal experience, often these patients aren't referred to urology at that point. So it's how we target that particular group of patients who may benefit um, from some form of P10s uh, to help. There are some small studies um, looking at SNS implantation in this population. Um, and I'm pleased to say there's no reported increase in complication rate uh, when compared to other uh, patients. Um, what the authors of these reports do recommend is that patients being considered for SNS should not have had a relapse in more than two years. Uh, unfortunately, I suspect this rules out rather a large group uh, of the um, MS population. Surgery in the context of managing multiple sclerosis bladder um, should the commonest surgery that we undertake normally is in female patients with stress urinary incontinence. These should be seen and assessed and treated uh, as uh, the non neurogenic population. Um, I would always recommend good urodynamic studies in this group prior to undertaking invasive surgery. 
Clamylis is the plus, it is feasible in this patient group. And there's a small study um, by Zakovar et al, uh, where he operated on nine patients and demonstrated at this two year follow up improved capacity from 100 to almost 800 mils, with a continence rate reported at more than 90%. Um, Cystectomy and allele conduit formation in this group really is for those with devastating urinary incontinence or lower urinary tract symptoms. I've personally only undertaken it in those who've had skin integrity issues uh, or where the upper tracts are at risk. The post-operative recovery may include a worsening of their MS symptoms and the patient should be warned about this and probably ought to form part of the counselling and the consent process uh, of these patients. Uh, an area that we don't always get involved in, but maybe, uh, is the issue of sexual dysfunction uh, in patients with MS. It affects both males and females, and the commonest uh, issues are with erectile dysfunction, uh, delayed ejaculation, uh, decreased libido in both males and females, vaginal dryness, and decreased genital sensation. The management of these symptoms is the same as in the non-MS population uh, and includes uh, PD-5 inhibitors for the men and um, um, uh, vaginal uh, topical treatments uh, for the females. Many studies investigating sexual dysfunction in the MS population um, have looked at um, other aspects and have found that untreated depression is uh, prevalent in up to 70% of patients uh, who present with um, sexual dysfunction. And I suspect it's just something to be aware of. Uh, if we are seeing these patients in the clinic, uh, then it may be uh, something that we should uh, ask the patients about. Finally, I just wanted to put up a slide of MS and COVID-19, because uh, I suspect that I'm never going to be able to use this slide again. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, the Italians were first out the blocks, um, and there's an Italian group uh, um, uh, led by Perotta et al, uh, looking at 76 MS patients who tested positive uh, for COVID-19. 21% uh, of the patients reported a deterioration in their MS symptoms as a result of uh, contracting COVID. Uh, to 23% of those affected were hospitalised with 10% critically unwell or uh, subsequently passed away after a spell on intensive care. They were at pains to point out that the majority of those that did end up critically unwell did have other underlying comorbidities. A uh, Serbian group led by Stojanov uh, uh, looked at the psychological well-being uh, of his MS patients and compared them to healthy controls. And there was significant difference uh, in their psychological well-being. Uh, the vast majority of those uh, questioned uh, reported that they were worried about the effect that COVID would have on their MS symptoms. Uh, they feared that they would uh, not be given access to hospital treatment, including intensive care if required, and that their drug therapies would no longer be available. So if you do have patients with chronic neurological problems, you know, addressing some of these concerns and issues uh, may go some way to allaying some of their fears. So in summary, I would say that the majority of patients with MS will need a urologist at some point uh, in their disease to improve their quality of life. It's really important that we work with the multidisciplinary team, MS nurses and neurology colleagues to provide uh, the correct bladder management at the most appropriate time. Sometimes I feel that we're involved too late and that there could have been some significant improvements in the patient's quality of life, perhaps if we'd been involved sooner. There is a limited role for reconstructive surgery uh, in this patient group as it is a progressive neurological condition. It should only be undertaken after careful consideration and discussion within an MDT. Thank you very much. And uh, do you have any questions? Right. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to be speaking about spina bifida, which is a, a group of patients uh, quite close to my heart who I enjoy looking after and I hope to share that enthusiasm with you. Um, spina bifida arises during the first 30 days of gestation um, as the spinal cord is formed from the uh, neural plate, which itself forms from the ectoderm. Basically, neural plate forms into a tube by folding in and it's where the folding in fails to unite that results in a split spine or spina bifida. Uh, there are several forms of spina bifida. Spina bifida occulta is the most minor form which only involves um, failure of the fusion of these bony elements of the spine. It's actually present in up to 15% of uh, the population very often has no neurological effect at all. The uh, 
next most common form is myelomeningocele, where there is the split in the spinal cord as well, and neural elements are involved. And then meningocele is less common. Uh, meningocele and myelomeningocele may be closed, um, as in the cystic structure that you see here, or open, where the uh, underlying neural tissue is exposed to the um, amniotic fluid and then air after birth. Sacrogenesis is a separate uh, congenital condition but has many um, similarities to spina bifida, so it tends to be managed in a very similar way. Risk factors for spina bifida are well recognized um, and the folic acid story is probably well known to most. Uh, having had a previous child with spina bifida actually is a much higher risk factor because of gene genetic elements, so we have about a 30-fold increased risk which represents about a 4% chance of having a second child with spina bifida. Pre-gestational maternal diabetes is also important as there are some uh, anti-epileptic medications and uh, a maternal obesity. The folic acid story uh, comes about because of DNA methylation um, and the failure of that which leads to the, the spina bifida deformity. The dietary factor is not 100% reliable because of the genetic issues which involve folic acid receptor antibodies. So the recommended dietary intake of 400 micrograms a day, only 50% reduces the risk. And of course, you have to be taking that well before those first 30 days of pregnancy, when you may not even be aware that you're pregnant. In terms of incidence, uh, this is less common than it was in the northern uh, industrial cities of the UK, where some of us live and work. Uh, there were up to five or more per thousand live births at some stages um, in the 1980s and that has now fallen away fortunately. Um, across the world incidence varies very much depending on dietary factors, cultural factors, uh, the availability of prenatal diagnosis and also the availability and acceptability in certain cultures of uh, prenatal termination of pregnancy in affected individuals. The urological impact of uh, spina bifida is, of course, because it generates a neuropathic bladder and bowel. It is very important, however, to realize, and I hope I'll explain shortly why, this is not just congenital spinal cord injury. There is a lot more to it than that, and that comes down to the urodynamic differences and the other issues with these unfortunate patients. As a result of those factors, there is a much higher risk of renal and upper tract damage damage in spinal bifida patients as opposed to spinal cord injury patients at similar levels. And you could argue uh, that it has a far higher impact on quality of life as a result. So as uh, has already been discussed this morning, with spinal cord injury, patients generally fall into two urodynamic groups. They may have a reflex or contractile pattern with detrusor overactivity and detrusor sphincter dysinergia or they may have an acontractile or a reflexic or flaccid type situation where they have absent detrusor activity and stress incontinence. Those groups uh, predominate in spinal cord injury, but in spinal bi spina bifida, they are in the minority. And the majority of patients with spina bifida have an intermediate pattern with detrusor overactivity, incomplete emptying, a non-relaxing sphincter, and low compliance and surprisingly stress incontinence as well. The importance of this, of course, is that the non-relaxing sphincter and the low compliance lead to very high risk of kidney injury if nothing uh, further is done. In addition to the urodynamic effects, there are other effects of this spina bifida that impact upon the uh, urological problems. The predominant one is which is hydrocephalus, which is the result of the Chiari 2 malformation that these patients commonly have, whereby the brain stem and cerebellum uh, herniate down into the foramen magnum and block the flow of CSF, resulting in hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is well known in uh, spina bifida patients to be associated with poor IQ, low IQ, and low IQ in spina bifida relates to the uh, level of the spina bifida injury and the severity and um, the effects of hydrocephalus. But there are also separate and distinct changes um, in the cerebral cortex in spina bifida patients, uh, 
uh, particularly in the frontal and parietal lobes, which go a long way, I think, to understand, help understanding the problems that many of these patients have in terms of uh, coordination, problem solving, um, often issues like dyscalculia and uh, various other um, specific mental issues. The other issue with the hydrocephalus is that although the shunts uh, resolve the problem, the shunts are not problem free, you have frequent problems with those, you can get into issues about whether there's a shunt infection or urinary tract infection. And late death may quite often is a result of a shunt complication. Another uh, feature of spina bifida that commonly causes issues is the spinal deformity. This can be really very gross with very severe um, scoliosis requiring uh, major spinal surgery. The, major, the spinal surgery itself may result in further neurological problems and urological problems. It also causes chest deformity resulting in anaesthetic issues and the chest deformities associated with the brainstem problems can result in major uh, breathing problems. Likewise, the abdomen uh, may become very inaccessible, particularly one or other kidney on the wrong side of the scoliosis may be frankly unoperatable on. Um, and the abdomen can be very hostile and sighting stomas can be challenging and those stomas can then become difficult to revise because of obesity developing and pressure sores may also be a problem. So what of treatment? Something relatively new and quite exciting in spina bifida is the concept of prenatal surgery. So the MUMS trial, which was management of myeloma meningocele study, was a uh, multi-center randomized trial in the States where they randomized uh, patients to intrauterine prenatal closure of their spina bifida at about 30 weeks, I believe, to postnatal closure. And they demonstrated very conclusively that this was a benefit in reducing the requirement for VP shunting and also having generally better mental and motor function at 30 months. This is now probably the standard of care and is available in many centres, including the Great Ormond Street Centre in London. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any proven urological outcome data that shows significant neurodynamic differences. But to my mind, if there are fewer shunts and better motor and mental function, then whatever the urological disability, it will be better to, to be managed. If uh, the closure hasn't happened before birth, then uh, it needs to happen very soon after birth and VP shunting needs to be instituted as, as required. The early management will come down to setting up an MDT between all the various interested groups, including, of course, paediatric urology. Urological management, as with uh, all neurourology, really comes down to two aims. One is to prevent renal damage and two is to provide social continence. With spina bifida, there's two uh, strategies in the paediatric world that are discussed. One is expectant management and one is proactive management. Expectant management is basically based on the current repeated urinary tract studies, uh, ultrasound studies, looking for hydronephrosis or other signs of, of um, concern. Baseline neurodynamics are done, but it's not repeated very regularly. And clean intermittent catheterization and medication are only started if problems arise. With proactive management, the management is very much based on repeated urodynamics at really quite frequent intervals initially. It's also depends upon instituting clean intermittent catheterization early on and using um, medications such as oxybutynin, although I accept other anticholinergics are available nowadays, and uh, or Botox, which is um, licensed over two years of age. The idea here is to intervene when the aerodynamics indicate there is a developing risk rather than waiting for signs of that risk having taken place. So the factors that people look for are leak point pressures over 40 centimetres of water, poor compliance less than 20 mils, and appearances of trabeculation, diverticulae, etc. And the studies do show that these patients will tolerate clean intermittent catheterization much better because basically they haven't known anything else all of their life as opposed to trying to introduce it to a three or four year old, which having had a three or four year old in my life, um, relatively recently, I would imagine would be a complete nightmare. 
um, and there is a reduced need for cystoplasty and better renal outcome. There is still, of course, many of these patients will need to go on to surgery, either because the upper tract changes are developing or the pressures are looking dangerous, despite maximum medical therapy, or because, particularly as the child ages, the family and the child themselves begin to wish to explore consonance and independence and improving quality of life. The timing of such interventions is quite difficult and much debated. It's usually recommended to try and do the reconstructive surgery prior to secondary schooling, if that is uh, possible. The surgery that uh, can be offered is really either as a reconstruction or a diversion. In the sort of uh, 80s and earlier days, um, the standard thing was to do an ileal conduit and divert the urine. It was in the 80s and 90s that surgical reconstruction of the urinary tract came in and is now probably the standard of care. However, there are situations in which a temporary diversion either by means of a catheter or a vesicostomy or maybe an ileal conduit with a view to a later undiversion is appropriate. And thinking of the reconstructive surgery, there will be several elements to that. There will almost always be a cystoplasty required, which will usually require a segment of bowel because myomectomy has not really stood the test of time and um, tissue engineering is not yet mature enough for routine clinical use. You'll also probably need to do a bladder outflow procedure to ensure continence, and in boys that would usually be an artificial sphincter, in girls probably a rectus fascial sling. Pediatric urologists or certain pediatric urologists are very wedded to their bladder neck reconstructions. However, most adult reconstructive urologists are not, and it is us that deal with the complications of the bladder neck reconstructions. We'd also probably benefit from creating a metrophenoff or Monty stoma for these patients so they can catheterize more easily in their chairs. It's also worth always considering at the time of such surgery, whether a Malone anti-grade continence enema will help with the bowel care. Once the child is through the uh, paediatric care, at some point, they will need to be transferred on to adult care, um, a period we've called transition. The urological problems that present in the transition phase are usually that you are just following up an established urological management, following up a reconstructed spina bifida child, becoming an adult. You will also need to do some troubleshooting. There may be some problems with untreated incontinence or developing upper tract problems or even developing renal failure and you can get into debates about reconstruction prior to renal transplantation, etc. Stones are quite a common problem. And it is in my experience during this period that the issues of bowels become more prominent and that sex raises its head. General problems of, independent, of transition include a sort of balance between uh, the increasing wish for independence of the patient against safety so that they will wish to go out partying and they will wish to not bother with their intermittent catheterization, but you will need to continue to encourage them to do the catheters. And a lot of the problems come down for loss of that MDT support that was there in paediatric time, but isn't once you become an adult. Transition clinics and paediatric adult liaison have been very helpful in reducing some of the problems that we used to see in this area in the past. I hope never to give a talk about neurourology without including bowels and sex. And some people believe these are my two favorite subjects, which is not quite true. The bowel management in spina bifida uh, basically it comes down to regular and efficient emptying as it does in all neurological problems and generally that can be achieved with manual evacuation or possibly peristine um, starting in quite early life. Other techniques including MACE are available and some patients will end up with colostomies. Sex. Most patients with spina bifida in my experience are very interested but really quite ignorant about sex. This may sometimes be an issue about parental overprotection and you can get into some difficulty trying to raise the subject at uh, consultations. Patients will often have self-image problems. Female fertility, however, is pretty normal and 75% of males will be potent and the other 25% can usually be helped to be potent. One consequence of sex is pregnancy and it's very important to recognize that 
patients with spina bifida have a very high risk of having spina bifida offspring and that they will not accept the standard advice to have a termination very well. The other issue about uh, pregnancy in spina bifida is the need to protect your carefully created bladder reconstruction and I thoroughly recommend planned caesarean sections with you present rather than being called in in the middle of the night. <clears throat> Adult care follows the same pattern, it's really a matter of following up these patients and you do end up with some very challenging uh, but very rewarding revision surgeries. You also get yourself involved um, in issues of care provision because these patients are usually very dependent on their parents as prime carers and obviously as they age their parents age and you can uh, run into problems. Bowel problems tend to become more common, obesity certainly becomes more common and that can lead on to the various problems we discussed earlier and sex in pregnancy is obviously an ongoing issue. So the main problems really with adult spina bifida is aging. The patients are aging, their conduits are aging, their cystoplasties and their sphincters are aging and failing and need to be replaced. Their carers are aging and dying off sadly uh, and likewise their clinicians are aging and retiring and or dying off. The other major problem is the fragmentation of their care and the fact that they are a rare group so that the uh, GPs will very, very rarely have more than one such patient in their career and won't be terribly helpful and social care can also be helpful. I tend to regard these patients as a bit of a lost tribe and my personal solution would be to include them in the spinal injury unit set up but the political will for that unfortunately doesn't seem to be there. So in summary, spina bifida I think are a very interesting and very uh, satisfying and enjoyable group of patients to look after but I would uh, thoroughly echo and emphasize uh, the point that Simon Harrison made in his nice uh, guidelines for the neuropathic bladder that if you wouldn't want to get involved in caring for these sorts of patients you need to accept that you will be asked to deal with all of the problems with all of the family and you will need to provide lifelong follow-up and as I've just mentioned, I personally feel that would be best provided in the spinal injuries unit, but that's a political and financial decision which people continue to argue about sadly. From a urological point of view, the important things to remember are that the upper tracts are at risk in all of these patients, particularly the males, uh, greater than the females, and the higher the level of the spinal bifida, the higher the risk in general. Consonance is also at risk in all of them, uh, but as in all of these situations girls tend to be less consonant than boys. The urological outcome uh, certainly can be influenced by prenatal and paediatric care and the problems that we see now in patients who've gone through good paediatric care um, compared to the ones that I maybe saw many years back in my training are light and day. The timing of reconstructions Reconstructive surgery is an interesting point and often requires some debate between the paediatric and adult care team, but what you actually do is fairly standard. Transition issues are always um, a challenge and interesting, and I'm very pleased to say that area seems to have significantly improved over the last 20 years of my experience. Long-term urological follow-up is vital and because of its, the nature of that follow-up, you often find that you are the primary carer in a sense for these patients and therefore Simon Harrison's advice and guidance that you must also pay attention to all the other issues including the bowels and sex remain very important. So thank you very much for your attention. Hello everybody, I'm back again. I think we are having a great session with a lot of interaction. This will be the last presentation of this session and I've been asked to speak on the new treatment options in neurourology. My name is Rizwan Hamid, and I work at UCLH in London and the London Spinal Injuries Center. These are my disclosures. I based my talk or divided it into these sections. Before we go on to discuss what are the new treatment options, we'd like to see what 
are we trying to achieve? What are the limitations of the treatment options we currently have? Then I'm going to introduce a few new treatment options which are on the horizon, and we'll try to draw some conclusions at the end. According to the EAU, the aim of the treatment for a neurogenic bladder dysfunction is protection of the upper tract, improvement of the urinary incontinence, restoration of the lower urinary tract function, and improve patient's quality of life. Like any other treatment options, there are limitations. If they are drug therapies, a number of patients cannot tolerate them or they are not efficacious. On the other hand, major surgery like ileocystoplasty, all, although it is very effective, but there can be problems with long surgery, electrolyte imbalance, and the long and short-term complications. Like most of the treatment options we have in functional urology, there is not one modality or one treatment option which fulfills the requirement of all the aims of treatment which we are trying to achieve. In other words, one size does not fit all. With this background, what are the emerging treatment options? And when we, and when we try to look at the crystal ball and try to uh, make some predictions, we know very well in this world of COVID-19 that most, more often than not, the predictions do not come true. With that in mind, I'm going to discuss some new drug therapies we have got. What are the options in acute spinal cord injury? And this is something which is very important because as we all know, it is the neurogenic bladder dysfunction or the neurogenic detrusor overactivity which can lead to poor compliance and upper tract damage. Neuromodulation or stimulation is the new thing which is now coming up. And I think probably it will have a great role to play in the management of our patients who control their bladder symptoms. Minimally invasive therapies, robotics and laparoscopic is taking up in oncology. And I think it has, will have a role to play for our patients in neurological surgical treatment. There are promising therapies, and I've put it in inverted coma still as that's been going on for a number of decades, but unfortunately, we've not been able to move them from the bench side to the patient care or to the bedside. And then I'll try to draw some conclusions. There are a number of potential drugs which are on the market. And as you know, most of them work on the effector sites like anticholinergics or uh, beta-3 agonists. The thing which are coming up on the horizons is this cannabinoids, although they have been investigated in multiple sclerosis, but I think this is the exciting new development with the new drugs, which will be looking at the receptor functions of trip channels and ATP. A lot of work has been done, and I can see that these will be coming up as a treatment option for our patients in the future. Before I move on to the Invasive therapies, I would just like to introduce this concept of bladder drainage. As you know, one of the challenges in our patient is how to have an effective means of bladder emptying, which can overcome sphincter dyssynergia. A proportion of our patients cannot either self catheterize or avoid uh, naturally with a reasonable pressure, and they need to have a means of bladder emptying, which by and large is in a uh, suprapubic catheter which comes with its own problems. This is a new concept in females of a technique of bladder emptying, which you can see here on the, on the, on the right-hand side, it's a small intraurethral disc, which can be kept in place. It's got an outer sheet and an inner. And this uh, phase two trial has shown that it significantly improves the bladder capacity and decreases the infections when it was compared to the self-intermittent catheterization. I think it's an exciting technique and I look forward to the uh, phase three trials. Moving on to the control of neurogenic or rather prevention of the neurogenic uh, detrusor overactivity in acute spinal cord state. And there can be two options. One is botulinum toxin and the other is sacral nerve stimulation. As you know that Botox has revolutionized the treatment of our patients with neurogenic detrusor overactivity, 
in all uh, conditions for uh, NDO. However, we have not still managed to use it in the acute stage where it can suppress the development of NDO. This is a study, not in humans, in rats, which has shown that there can be functional and histological outcome which can, uh, uh, which is better, but not statistically significant, i.e. it has not been able to suppress, but I can see a lot of, uh, 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 in the future, this treatment modality being incorporated into our management algorithm. What has been shown to suppress the overactivity is neuromodulation. And as I said, uh, and as I said in the beginning, I think all techniques of neurostimulation will be investigated further and I think this is exciting new development for our patients for control of symptoms. This is a study of the transcutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. And I stress this is in the acute stage where it showed that the bladder capacity in DST was not worse than compared to the controls. And it, one is, it is felt that the transcutaneous stimulation can alter the course of neurogenic bladder in the acute stage. So if you neuromodulate early on, probably the patients will not develop overactivity. I'm sure most of us would have uh, read this excellent publication from KD Siever in which bilateral sacral love stimulation was done. And what he showed was that no patient developed NDO in urodynamic studies for more than two years. And this suggests that if we neuromodulate our patients early on, probably they will not develop neurogenic disorder overactivity with all, the, with all the associated complications. On that background, uh, Sean Elliott from Minnesota in the United States has set up this randomized trial looking at early sacral nerve stimulation. And we are very much looking forward to this trial. But this can prove pivotal in the suppression of the neurogenic detrusor overactivity from the start. What about the minimal the role of minimally invasive surgery for our patients? And there are now a number of complications coming from all parts of the world, looking at the blood and neck procedures, looking at the cystectomy and augmentation cystoplasty in neurogenic patients, looking at the cutaneous uh, uh, continent diversion like Mitrofenov, and there are a number of groups which are doing everything intracorporeal. So I think this is an exciting new development in which our patients can have minimal invasive surgery with probably as good as an outcome. And I've just uh, shared with you one paper of laparoscopic artificial urinary sphincter insertion at the blood and neck in men from uh, Emmanuel Chati Castor group. Although the number of patients is only six, but what he has shown is that it is safe and effective, and this can be say, uh, done in neurogenic patients with whom require a blood and neck, in C, a blood and neck uh, artificial sphincter. I'm going to spend a few minutes on the neuromodulation techniques, which can be tibial, sacral, and transcranial, because I think this is probably one of the most exciting areas of uh, investigation for the control of symptoms in our patient group. Tibial uh, nerve stimulation has been trialed in a number of, uh, uh, from a number of centers, both in the RCTs and non-RCTs, and it suggests that the tibial nerve stimulation is effective for our patient group, although more uh, robust randomized trials are required. Thomas Kastler's group has shown that this tibial nerve stimulation for treatment of our neurogenic uh, patients is not only uh, effective, but also the patients is well received by the patients and they're setting up an international randomized control trial to look at this in more detail. And I feel that along with sacral nerve stimulation, this will be one of the more main treatment modalities in the future for control of neurogenic dysprosor overactivity for our patients. What is the role of sacral nerve stimulation in neurogenic uh, uh, patients? And as I said, a number, this is a good systematic review from Marcio Everbeck from Brazil that shows that SNM has now been increasingly used for neurogenic bladder dysfunction. Mainly it has been investigated in spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis patients, but that is obvious as majority of patients 
fall under these two groups. And it's a promising therapy in selected group of patients, which has got the potential to control the symptoms in our patient group on a long-term basis. This is a good meta-analysis from, uh, or systematic review from Thomas Kessler, which shows that uh, the sacral nerve stimulation can be effective in all types of uh, neurogenic, uh, neuro neurological conditions. This is a good presentation from Del Popolo's group in Italy, which shows that patients who have got uh, neurogenic detrusor overactivity and also neurogenic bladder dysfunction can benefit from sacral nerve stimulation on a long-term basis. Half of these patients were incomplete spinal cord injury. Similarly, from Italy, this group has shown that in MS patients, sacral nerve stimulation can be effective to control the number of maturations, increase the voided volume, and decrease the number of pads. It does improve the quality of life. And what they have concluded is that the sacral nerve stimulation is a good option for control of bladder dysfunction in MS patients. And importantly, in their view, that it not only controls the overactivity part, but also facilitates bladder emptying for which they probably will not require uh, self-intermittent catheterization, which will otherwise be the case. What about transcranial magnetic stimulation? This is a new thing coming on the horizon. It's almost new off the press from last year. And it shows that magnetic stimulation of the uh, brain can help control the symptoms of uh, overactive bladder in neurogenic population. And you can see that high frequency stimulation can not only improve the detrusor contraction, but also can improve the sphincter function, whilst the low frequency can help with the overactivity. Meaning thereby is that a combination of stimulation can control the storage symptoms, but also can help with the voiding symptoms. So mainly in the Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis, but probably can be uh, utilized in incomplete spine cord lesions also. And I think this is an exciting new development, again, part of the neurostimulation group, which we very much look forward uh, for further uh, refinements in these treatment options. What about the treatment of DSD for our patients? And as we know that the sphincter dyssynergia is the main cause which can lead to high pressure bladder, loss of compliance, leading to the uh, increased pressure. A number of studies over the last uh, uh, two or three decades have shown that Botox can be effective to decrease the sphincter dyssynergia. However, this has not been standardized, but two to four places between nine and three o'clock are used. 100 units of Botox is utilized. The important thing here is that if one has to do it via cystoscope, then at least one centimeter deep needs to be, uh, uh, one needs to go one centimeter deep so that the injections are in the muscle and not in the submucosa. Couple of last slides looking at the still promising therapies. One of them is uh, rerouting from the lumbar to the sacral part. Zhao in, in China popularized this but when Katie Sievert in Europe and uh, Kenneth Peters in America try to replicate this, it has not been very effective, but it is a promising therapy. As is the spinal cord regeneration, and there have been phase two trials with implantation of olfactory cells into the sacral maturation center and see if they can regenerate. But again, it is still in experimental stages. As is this lovely, experiment from Tony Atala, which we all know the last 20 years of bladder regenerating, but we have not seen further publications on this. And lastly, the implantation of the really type sphincter directly onto the nerves, which is very promising, but none of these has been uh, moved from the bench side to the, uh, to the patient's bedside. And I very much encourage our next generation of neurourologists to look at these options and try to research in one of these uh, areas. In conclusion, NDO can be su successfully controlled with a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach. 
New drugs are being developed, which act mainly on the afferent pathways. It might be possible to abolish NDO by early neuromodulation. Minimally invasive surgeries will probably become more common, especially for pelvic indications like bladder neck AUS and cystoplasty. And lastly, I think the most exciting area of development is neuromodulation, both tibial, sacral, and probably transcranial magnet magnetic one, which can be utilized as minimally invasive therapies in carefully selected patients and consult patients with neurogenic bladder dysfunction. Uh, thank you very much. And I think with this, I would like to draw this session to the close. I think it has been a great session where we have seen a high level of in interaction and it has been a pleasure to interact with all of you, albeit virtually. I hope we have managed to answer your questions as best as we could. I hope that you're going to enjoy the rest of the meeting and I'm really looking forward to next year BAUS where we hope we'll be back to normal with a face-to-face -face format. Uh, goodbye and stay safe. Thank you.